Please turn in the back of your hymnals to the Canons of Dort, particularly to page 913. We are looking at the fifth head, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, and we're looking at the eighth article, Article 8. This article is called The Certainty of This Perseverance, or This Preservation. Preservation is God's side of perseverance. The saints must persevere, but it's only because of God's preservation that they do so. Follow along as I read. So it is not by their own merits or strength, but by God's undeserved mercy, that they neither forfeit faith and, and grace totally, nor remain in their downfalls to the end that they're lost. With respect to themselves, this not only easily could happen, but also undoubtedly would happen. But with respect to God, it cannot possibly happen, since His plan cannot be changed, His promise cannot fail. The calling, according to His purpose, cannot be revoked. The merit of Christ, as well as His interceding and preserving, cannot be nullified. The sealing of the Holy Spirit can neither be invalidated nor wiped out. Now we'll look at a number of passages of Scripture that help us to gain insight from the Word of God into what Dort uh, has just stated in Article Number Eight. Uh, first, Matthew uh, chapter twenty-four. Be reading verses nine through. 24 of Matthew 24. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants uh, in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no flesh, or as it translated here, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. The next text to read is in Romans chapter 8. Be reading verses 28 through 34 of Romans 8. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him 
up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us? Next passage, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 14. And then we'll read one other verse in Ephesians. Uh, I, actually, I meant 13 and 14. That's my fault. Verses 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee or down payment of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And then with a very similar thought expressed in a little bit of a uh, different manner, Ephesians 4, verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And then the last passage is from Revelation 7, 3 and 4 and 9. Revelation 7, 3 and 4, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And then verse 9, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Let us pray. Father, we do ask that your Holy Spirit now would use thy word uh, to transform our minds and to settle our hearts in the peace and the confidence of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The title of the sermon today is The Certainty of Perseverance. And again, uh, we are certain of perseverance because we are certain of what undergirds perseverance, God's preservation. We have learned so far in this fifth head of the Canons of Dort that sin still rem remains in the lives of believers. Uh, they must battle with their sins. And because of this, uh, no one would remain faithful apart from God's grace. We saw uh, back in article uh, number three, uh, God is faithful, mercifully strengthening them in the grace once conferred on them and powerfully preserving them in it to the end. There it states quite beautifully uh, that doctrine of perseverance undergirded by grace. But the articles, as you recall, go on to ask, well, what about stumbles? You know, the big sins that uh, professing Christians fall into. What about them? Well, they don't cancel grace either. But big sins call for big repentance. And God will not let them fall uh, so as to perish. But He will restore them. He will renew them as they come to repentance uh, over uh, those uh, sins. Thus, uh, we read now in Article 8, So uh, it is uh, not by their own merits or strength, but by God's undeserved mercy, that they neither forfeit faith and grace totally, nor remain in their downfalls to the end of their loss. That is why, as huge as some stumble, they will not be lost because of that grace. Perseverance is a certainty for the regenerate person. 
as Paul beautifully says and sums up this doctrine in a verse, Philippians 1.6, He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. So what makes this so? There's three things that we're going to be looking at that makes this so. It is so due to its source, due to its security, and due to its sealing. First, this doctrine is certain due to its source. What's the source? Well, it's rooted in God's sovereign plan. God is the sovereign God who says, I have determined, I have declared the end from the beginning. He has a plan. Uh, why is anyone saved at all? Well, it's because of God's plan. A plan in which uh, God uh, had a people that he foreknew. And on the basis of that foreknowledge of God, that love ahead of time, he elected them and secured them and thus predestinated them, which we read about here in Romans chapter 8. It's because of God's plan that uh, effectually and powerfully calls people out by the gospel. They are regenerated and then they are converted and they are saved in the first place. We track it to God's sovereign plan. We don't locate it in the free will of man. And neither is a person's perseverance to be located in the free will of man. Now, uh, I take you back to the first text I read this morning, Matthew chapter 24, uh, to uh, consider here for a few moments. In Matthew 24, we see that two things are fundamentally happening on the canvas of this uh, globe. Uh, first of all, there are great tribulations occurring. Uh, those great tribulations shake out uh, primarily in two forms. One, uh, persecution, and two, uh, uh, apostasy through prophetic falsehood uh, being multiplied. That's uh, the first, uh, uh, th those are the first, uh, uh, those two things, excuse me, uh, are, are the tribulations uh, that are growing and continue upon the earth. Now the other thing that's happening at the same time as uh, these tribulations is issuing in the persecution and the falling away of God's people is that the gospel is being proclaimed throughout the world. So they happen in tandem. So what is Christ talking about? Well, he's transitioning from the Old Covenant temple. If you've read Matthew 24, they're looking at the temple and Christ is talking about the temple, but he's transitioning as he talks from that Old Covenant temple into the New Covenant temple. So that there, there are uh, uh, dual activities occurring uh, with regard to that New Covenant temple. On the one hand, it's being torn down. On another hand, it's being built up. And in the midst of all this, uh, Matthew says, it's those who, Matthew quoting Jesus says, it's those who endure to the end through all this uh, that will be saved. The road is definitely rough for the Christian church and its way in the world. Many will fall away, uh, but those who endure to the end will be saved. So both of these responses, both of these results, uh, will be occurring, falling and enduring. But the question then becomes, uh, okay, uh, you know, th there's no cake, this is no cakewalk, it's not easy, uh, but how do you account uh, for the outcome. Uh, how do you account for those who endure? Now, if you just stop reading at that point, you might say on a, on a simple level read, uh, you're, you're instructed that there's a wild ride and I've got to hang on. Uh, you know, just like at, at an amusement park, sometimes you have these crazy wild rides and just shake you to your bones and you feel like, you know, man, I got to hang on. I could be thrown out of this thing. Uh, it, it, that's 
what must happen in the light of this wild ride through this world. Uh, you must endure. And if you don't endure, you will perish. Uh, it, you, you've got to hang on or you'll fall out. So the Arminians say, yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, how much clearer do you want it? You know, <laughs> it's right here. The, the gospel's preached, you hear it, and you decide of your free will whether or not you embrace it. And, uh, and once you've embraced it, you've got to hold on to it. Uh, and if you don't, uh, well, guess what? Uh, you'll, you'll cave. Uh, you'll, you, you won't make it. So hang on. Uh, and if you don't, uh, uh, God did all he could do uh, to, to, to help you. Uh, he's done all he could and will do. But at the end of the day, it's up to you to be holding on to what God has given you. And it's uh, totally your fault uh, if you fall away because God's done all his part uh, for you. So if, if indeed you dip out and run away because the kitchen is too hot, uh, or if you run after some false gospel and leave the truth behind, uh, you're uh, the one to blame. God's given you all you need to endure if you will only avail yourself. Because only those who endure to the end will be saved. So endure, old oh man, endure, old woman. There's the message from the Armenian perspective. Now, on the basis of reading these texts, it's, it'd be easy to say, well, that seems like a legitimate account of, of the story there. But you've got to read on to what Jesus says. Uh, verses 21 and 22 particularly uh, there will be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, and, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no flesh would be saved. But, for the sake of the elect, those days are cut short. For the sake of the elect, the deep trials, Jesus says, are cut short. The trials in those days are limited. There will be no constant, unending hammering away until finally everyone, as it is, lets go. To only be down to a couple with strong hands and iron wills. No, it's cut short for the elect's sake. Now that's God's plan. The elect are the ones who what? Hang on. The elect are those who do not crash. Why? Because God is taking care of them according to His sovereign plan and power through great trial and tribulation. The elect can't fall. God won't let them. He will protect them. Through the heat of persecution, even though it is strong and it is long, it's not strong enough or long enough to dislodge the elect. They persevere through it. Well, who, who then falls? I mean, somebody's falling here. Who's falling? Well, the members of God's temple, the, the visible church, who profess Christ, but don't truly possess Christ. That is, those who are not elect. The elect cannot, they will not cave. Why? Because God has saved them and He sustains them. And so we see here, as Dort says, with respect to themselves, this not only easily could happen, that is, they could fall away, but also undoubtedly would happen, in and of themselves, but with respect to God, it can't possibly happen since His plan can't be changed. There it is. And that's what Jesus says here. Notice, uh, if you would, verse 24. False Christ, false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible. In other words, Jesus, it's not possible. 
but so persuasive, so deceptive, is this kind of a gospel message that even the elect would be deceived, if it were possible. And so Jesus is saying here, look, uh, they cannot be taken out in persecution and trial, neither can they be faked out. Now notice how that reads. It's not as the Arminian want to read it. The elect can't be deceived by damning doctrines. Why? Because they are his elect, and it's impossible to lead astray one of the elect. Now, they may sin, as we've already learned about. They may waffle. They may wander off course. Uh, they may stumble and fall. They may get snookered for a while about something that's not true. But at, at the end, God will retrieve them. Why? Because of His election that secures them, His sovereign plan. Many will be knocked out. The way is hard. Many will be faked out. There's much deception afoot. But those in God's plan won't if they are elect. They have true colors. Colors that God has colored them with and these colors will not bleed. But through the war they will stand and reveal who they are. Why do they persevere? Jesus makes it clear. Romans makes it clear, chapter 8, they are elect. Well, they also persevere not only because of God's plan, but also due to their security. The point here is that the elect certainly persevere through trials of persecution and prophetic lies because Christ has actually done something to secure them. Christ has... First of all, forensically settled their case in court. Second, Christ intercedes for them. Third, Christ has given them eternal life. Fourth, Christ has given them the presence of the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. And now we look at Romans chapter 8 with regard to this second uh, uh, point, that they are secured and thus uh, persevere by Christ. Now Romans chapter 8 tell us that we are uh, those whom God has predestined, those whom God has called, we are justified. And those whom uh, Christ uh, or God has justified, he, he has justified them because of the death of Jesus. We cannot, if we are one of His, be condemned. Why? because of the death of Jesus in our behalf. Our case, though we deserve to be condemned, our case is settled in God's court uh, by Jesus Christ in behalf of all His elect. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justified. Who is to condemn? Christ is the one who died. There it is. Christ has borne the sins, the curse of His people. They are safe from condemnation. Christ has also culminated His obedience in the cross. They are dressed in His perfect righteousness. They are forensically secure from judgment. And they are, as it is because of that perfect righteousness, they are already uh, participants in heaven. So Paul asks the rhetorical question. Verse 33, who can bring a charge against God's elect? Who can condemn them? These are rhetorical questions because the answer is, well, nobody can if this is what Jesus has done in their behalf. In and of themselves, every one of God's elect are sinners and lawbreakers. Uh, they deserve condemnation and death. But God justifies them, brothers and sisters. He justifies you if you trust in Jesus forgiving your sins, clothing you in righteousness. You stand in His courtroom with confidence because of Christ. Listen, if you are a person who dreads the all-seeing eyes of a holy God, 
It's true that not one sin escapes his sight. Nothing is hidden from his uh, observation. But Christ is the one to run to. Christ is the one to run to. Lord Jesus, save me. Bring me under the cover of your cross for forgiveness and righteousness. Let the courtroom gavel fall upon me in Christ, justified in his sight. Secondly, Christ secures us, as verse 34 says, because he intercedes for us. Just like he prayed for Peter, I pray that your faith may not fail. So Jesus continues at the right hand of the Father, interceding actively now in our behalf, and he secures us by the power of his intercession. Thirdly, Christ gives us eternal life. As it says in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I give eternal life to my sheep, and no one will snatch them out of my hand, and certainly no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. So Jesus says, they're in my hand, and my hand is in the Father's hand. (laughs) Uh, No one can snatch them out. There's the certainty of eternal life given to them by Jesus Christ. And then lastly, not only has he given them eternal life, but as Ephesians says, he's given them a down payment of that life. In other words, that eternal life which is of the future, in the world to come that will never end and is glorious in communion with God, that life now is participated in, as Paul says in Ephesians 1, uh, 13 and 14, as a guarantee, a down payment. And those two words go together. That's why you'll find translations. Some will say down payment. Some will say guarantee. But it's, but it's a guarantee that is, it's a, it's a down payment that is a guarantee. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings us the, a slice of the pie of heaven right into your heart as a down payment and a guarantee that if He's given you the part, you're going to get the rest of it. That's the Holy Spirit as uh, the presence of God in Jesus Christ that He won for you and for me if you're a believer in Jesus. It requires perfect righteousness to purchase heaven. And Christ purchased it with His righteousness and clothes you with it so that you too can enjoy this down payment of eternal life in the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. He has secured eternal life. He has secured heaven. He has secured the Holy Spirit for all His elect. And thus His elect certainly perseveres. Why? Because Christ has secured them in what He has done. His his redemption cannot fail. Who can bring a charge against them? Who can snatch them from his hand? Who can powerfully supplant or turn off the power of his intercessory prayers for them? None. 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 The elect certainly persevere because of Christ that has secured them, but also, lastly, because that Holy Spirit that is a down payment Paul also, and the book of Revelation indicates, seals them. Seals them. We saw how the Holy Spirit is a guarantee in Ephesians 1.14, but that's not all. The Holy Spirit is also given to believers not only as a down payment and guarantee of the future, but chapter 4, verse 30 tells us that the Holy Spirit Uh, that we should not grieve it because He dwells within us, right? As believers, we possess Him, but we should not grieve the Spirit. Why? He has sealed us now in this life for the day of redemption. That great day when Jesus returns, the Spirit has, has sealed us. We can be confident that what He has sealed in this world will hang on until it appears in the world to come, in the world of the redemption that comes in the second coming of Jesus. And so in Revelation chapter 7, uh, we read about this sealing of God's servants. See, first they're God's servants. They're out there. The servants are out there. 
But then there's a process in which those servants get sealed until all of them are sealed. There's, there's a number of them. See, there's election, right? 144,000, a fullness. All must be sealed first. Then what happens? We find all those sealed standing before the throne and of the Lamb worshiping God. Sealed by the Spirit through the preaching of the Gospel, certainly will be gathered for worship in the world to come. Yes, they will pass through, as uh, uh, chapter 9 says, they will pass through great tribulation. But they will, their hearts will ultimately be kept from caving in or straying away by God's mighty seal of the Holy Spirit. And it's the, the beauty of this is that the Spirit indwells the hearts of believers. It enables them to uh, uh, irrevocably, from the very depths of their souls, to testify to Christ and His truth, uh, even through many dangers, toils, and snares to the end. The Spirit is what strengthens the heart because the Spirit is present right there, dwelling and thus strengthens that inner man and secures them to persevere very personally until that last day, the day of redemption. As Dort says, uh, uh, wonderfully says here, the sealing of the Holy Spirit can neither be invalidated nor wiped out. And if the sealing of the Holy Spirit uh, cannot be uh, invalidated or wiped out, uh, neither uh, can the one who is sealed by that Holy Spirit be invalidated or wiped out. So the sovereign grace of the Father, the purchasing power of the grace of the Son, and the presence of the grace of the Holy Spirit, you see these things all spell with certainty. The elect will persevere to the end and be saved. These great truths of this fifth head on the perseverance of the saints, God has revealed in His Word. And He wants you to know those truths. He wants you to know this truth. Why? To fortify your soul, uh, to have them fixed in your heart. Why? Because they will comfort your heart when all around you seems to be giving way. Uh, they will steal your will when the way is tough. And they will illumine your mind when your path is dark with danger. So, brothers and sisters, eat up these truths. Drink them in. Hold them uh, in your heart. For Christ has loved you first to the uttermost. And it's because of that that He will see you through to the uttermost as well. So let us trust God. Let us thank God for His grace, His mighty grace toward each of you who believe, each of you who are one of His own elect. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this